Awesome, great. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Oliver, and today we're going to go ahead and jump in and get started. Welcome to this session virtually. Uh, to our title today is Historically Marginalized Populations, Intentional Considerations as Service Providers. So there's a couple of sessions going on today at the Homeless Summit on kind of this topic and three different tracks. So if you've been attending the Homeless Summit yesterday, welcome again this morning. Today is more for our direct service providers and I will be representing from the road homes end um, for our direct service providers. I have an alternate title that was provided to me by one of our staff at the road home. So this is inequities in homeless systems, how to live through the injustice of it all and still show up tomorrow. So if you've been feeling a little bit as the rest of us have during the climate of this year, on um, that note, um, how is everyone feeling today um, about this kind of topic and what we're jumping into? Uh, we are going to be using in this virtual realm a different mechanism to kind of be able to interact with each other since we can't all be in one room together as usual. So if you do have a cell phone, um, we have a interaction option um, that you can use your cell phone or actually your device that you're on right now. Um, so you can text the road home to 22333 um, and respond A, B, C, D with these lovely emojis, or you can go to pollev.com slash the road home. Um, all the answers to this poll are anonymous, and let me know how you're feeling today about this topic when we talk about getting into um, our historically marginalized populations and what we're going to do to support them as service providers. Where are we at? Or just how you feel this morning. Ooh, and y'all are changing your answers. Nice. <laughs> great. Well, at least I know we're all technologically savvy and it's working. This is great. Um, I was going to put a, a sleepy one on here, just, just saying. Uh, but then I thought, well, you're here already, so we're going to we're gonna take off the snoozy. All right, I imagine, I'm gonna hope that some of our people that are kind of in our angry place are um, also feeling just a little angry on the topic in general and that we're even having to have this conversation. Um, the worried people, I'm right there with you. Not just about nervous about giving this conversation, but I think nervous about always entering this kind of space and where we're going to get. Um, and happy, I hope that we're happy um, about having these types of conversations and moving these conversations forward. Um, so thanks for participating and know that we're gonna hopefully have some more participating activities like this as we roll. I think you're all punking me now by continuing to play with us. Um, so a little introduction about myself. Like I said, I'm Elizabeth Oliver. I'm the Director of Innovation at The Road Home. And what that means is what I get to do is pretty exciting. So I get to look at the different inspired ideas of the people at the road home and the great work that they do. I get to move that inspiration into the land of ide ideation and work with people to take those inspired um, movements from their guests, from their tenants, from their residents, or from themselves, their staff, what they're seeing, the best practices around the country, around the world, put it into an idea, make it tangible, and then implement it. Um, so I'm in a really um, privileged place and get to really work off the idea of ideas of our staff. I wanted to set some expectations for our, um, our session today. Um, so we do have less than 60 minutes to cover a really heavy topic. And so we're not gonna be able to get incredibly deep. So kind of temper your expectations there. Um, I do want this to be a safe space, but also a brave space. Um, so be willing to challenge your own assumptions, your biases, your opinions, and your ideas. I may say some things that make you uncomfortable, but please stay present with me and us as a team. You may think I got this, I know this even better because then I know I've got some of you. 
but just love to get better and better, right? So you'll definitely be willing to challenge your assumptions. And on that idea, challenge ideas, not people. So if people have something to say, um, we're not challenging that person and this is something good to live by, um, we're challenging their idea and that always creates a great dialogue. Also, please remember to take care of yourself as we enter these spaces. Um, we want to remember self-care. Um, it Self-care, it honors ourselves, but it also honors the work that we do, who, who we do it with, and who we do it for. Um, and what I mean by that is if we can take care of ourselves, then we're going to be better at what we're doing. We're going to be better at being a support system for the person next to us, as we know we need to be. And we're going to be better at serving the people that we're trying to serve if we can take care of ourselves. So if some of this does feel a little heavy or shocking, or you do need a break, um, that's okay. And please do it because you're gonna be better for it. Um, and then as we do have these opportunities for anonymous participation, um, please, I ask that you refrain from inappropriate language or personal attacks. Um, I, we don't have a lot of free response, um, but we will and just to keep that space um, respectful. Um, so I have a question. We live in a world as service providers in homeless systems where we hear all the time evidence-based models. And I think a lot of us thrive on that. That gives us our backing to the work that we do. That's why we come to places like the Homeless Summit. And so, I would like you to throw out maybe one or two evidence-based models. Same deal as before, text them in, type them in. What's an evidence-based model that you've heard of, that you work off of? Throw it out. How's it first? Nice, that's the first one I would have done. Motivational interviewing. So the way this world, word cloud is working, I'm sure some of you have seen this before, is the more that people are saying the same thing, the louder that is getting on our screen. Looks like the most people are saying is housing first. But obviously we're seeing a lot of trauma-informed care, a lot of motivational interviewing, tick, um, looks like low barrier, um, low barrier shelter, I'm guessing is kind of how that one's playing out. Um, I love this. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Thank you all for your participation. So the reason that I bring up um, the evidence-based models is because of the fact that there are three different tracks for this topic right now. I don't know which one is the best one to be in, but I do know the best people to have these conversations is with you, service providers, because you are taught, live, and breathe on these evidence-based models. The data, research, studies, psychology, they all help each of you how to interact with your guests, your residents, your tenants, the people you mentor or supervise. You go to conferences like the one we are in right now to learn about the evidence-based models. And so we've got the data. We learn it and then we work with it and we practice it and we bring it to the people we're serving. And our why is why we want the best for the people we serve. So on that note, we're gonna be willing to dive into some stats here. So historically marginalized populations, I'm going to throw up a few graphs for us. So here's our general population. Um, we're gonna specifically focus for a second on the visuals on our um, on black and white folks in our community. So in the United States, black people make up 13% of the general population, but more than 40% of the homeless population. Similarly, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and people who identify as two or more races 
make up a disproportionate share of the homeless population. Hispanics and Latinx make up a share of the homeless population still unequal to their share of the general population, while whites and Asians are significantly um, underrepresented. And we also know that we have LGBTQ plus underrepresented um, in our general population, but overrepresented in our homeless population, specifically also in our youth homeless population. So these are our stats. This is what informs um, the data. So I know that you might think that this might be a little bit of a passive response. It's such a dramatic statistic, but I've got a task for you now. You have some evidence, which we like to lean on as service providers. Um, so we've got three steps. One, be brave enough to say more people of color are experiencing homelessness in America. Two, they are experiencing homelessness differently. Three, that matters. Just take a second to think about how that makes you feel. And when you're ready, let me know what you think about moving on. Um, oh, well, someone's ready. Let's do this. All right, let's keep going. Thank you for your participation. I really appreciate it. So, I know you're thinking she accidentally went back to her title slide, but it's a little different. I want to go back and to my really long boring title instead of the one that my staff member suggested to me and break it down a little. So why am I saying historically marginalized? Or sometimes you'll hear me say instead historically underrepresented instead of minorities. So not all marginalized groups are minorities in all areas. So for example, there's an overrepresentation of people of color in the criminal justice system. Why am I saying intentional considerations? When we put on our badges, we are not the policymakers or the executive leadership yet. But I see you, you're getting there. We are the direct service providers who have an incredible power and responsibility at our hands to be intentional with the knowledge we have and the knowledge we receive from our guests, residents, and tenants. And those in that intentional knowledge that we have and the intent and, and that we have, that how are we using it? What considerations are we making as service providers, as the people that we are being entrusted with that information? And so I have a short clip from Mark Jones from the National Innovation Service um, talking about this intention. 
And it's going to be a clip from a keynote that he gave. So he's going to say the word these in this clip. And so when he says these, he's referring to the people we serve. So um, whoever you are working with as a service provider. We have to be much more rigorous and much more intentional about listening to these voices. That's how systems get transformed. No system has ever changed without the input of the people who are being directly affected. So what can you do right now? That's always a good question to ask, right? Like, what are my immediate action steps, right? That's how the meeting ends. What are our action items? Your action items are to go back to your community and think about racial equity. That's it. All you need to do is go back to your community and think about racial equity. Ask yourself, how can I bring racial equity into this meeting? Ask yourself, how do I listen more attentively to the voices of the people who I'm helping. So we've got our action item. Time to go. Right? Wrestling? Well, I mean, technically, yes. But I, I mean, I planned for this. Um, just in case I was tanking and we could awkwardly end on the slide of a cat and some heavy thoughts. Um, but really what I love about what Mark is saying is that we, it sounds simple, but we cannot move forward without listening to our guests, to our tenants, to our residents. And who else is going to do that but us? And while it sounds simple, it's really not. Because when we start to the listening part, I think we can do, and I'm gonna explain why. It's when we try to voice that back to people that it starts to get hard. So let's talk a little bit about Pandora's box. Uh, so I couldn't find a stock image of Pandora's box, so I figured a thoughtful cat coming out of a box would do. Uh, but instead, uh, here's a story for you. I was speaking as a coworker just yesterday about introducing something cultural into the workplace. And this had come from a, from, a, from a natural conversation of introducing this, this cultural um, idea. And of course it goes into, is this legal? Um, what kind of pushback are we gonna receive? Uh, is, it, is it fair? Would there be people who are gonna copy it? And if they copy it, is that cultural appropriation? How do we prepare for the cultural appropriation? And um, is there gonna be backlash? Who takes the backlash? Um, at this point, uh, do we, I mean, do, I mean, do we just not do it? Is it, um, like, it's probably easier to just, like, like, we weren't doing it before, and, and things were fine, we're, st we're still ending homelessness, like, so let's, so, like, it's kind of on the table that we've got all of these questions to answer from this one thing that we listen to. So maybe we don't do it now. And this is a genuine conversation. And I am pointing no fingers to blame because I am participating in the conversation. Essentially, could, could moving this needle in this tiny direction by listening to one person's request open a Pandora's box of cultural requests was the next question. If we did this one thing, regardless of all the potential consequences that we could come up with, the last one on the list was, well, what else are gonna people, what else will people ask for if this works? And then are we gonna have to go through this list again and again and again? And would they all be things we could accommodate? 
So I looked into my crystal ball. I mean, I'm just kidding. I, I didn't. Um, but I did start to, to smile and I got a sort of snarky uh, twinkle in my eye. And if you have the unfortunate uh, chance of knowing me, you, you know what this looks like and usually gets me a little in trouble. And I sat up in my chair and I said, that sounds so great. <laughs> and, and while I'm sitting up in my chair, they sit back in their chair and like have kind of a, a quiz look on their face. And I said, what an opportunity for dialogue. We could have so many of these conversations. I have no idea what will work. I have no idea which one of these will work and what won't work until we try it. But we have to start giving people a venue for their voice to be heard and to see that we don't just listen, but we act on what they are saying so they can feel like they have a chance to move forward in a world that maybe hasn't looked completely like their own because it wasn't built by people that look like their own. And knowing I could go on a bit of a tangent, here they cut me off and said, and I love this, this is gonna be hard, isn't it? And I sat back at this point and said, oh yeah. And they looked at me and said, this is good. This is a moment. We are built for hard. So we're gonna do this anyway. If anyone can do this, it's us. Bring on the conversation. What I heard from this person was that they were willing to have intentional conversations. There was a bring it on for the hard. They wanted it to be brave. And that they trusted that if anybody could do something that was hard, it was us as service providers because we wake up every morning to do something that is hard. And we train for it and we do it and we are brave and we are intentional and we need to take an extra step and add an extra piece to this or lean on people in our community of other direct service providers who have already been doing this and listen to them and get tips from them on how to continue it. How can we be intentionally considering it and thinking about it? How can we, as Mark said, be bringing racial equity into our meetings, into our conversations? And are we ready to understand that it matters? So I wanna bring up a case study. No, it's not a case study. It's actually something really that happened. So even some of who the world might consider the smartest people in the world, uh, built artificial intelligence to help with the, in the healthcare system, to help with the lack of capacity for doctors and nurses in the urgent care. And this is from the Washington Post. Um, you can, I'll, I'll actually read the um, headline here. So racial bias in a medical algorithm favors white patients over sick of black patients. And this was, um, and to give you some background, what had happened is An algorithm was built for artificial intelligence, taking years and years and years and years of data of patients who had entered urgent cares or emergency centers and the types of symptoms that they had presented with and what treatment they needed, how fast they were treated and who needed what type of care and 
like and how severe that was and and how quickly they needed to be treated to be able to survive and so that hopefully if introducing this artificial intelligence this could help look at those symptoms quickly identify what they were and then help prioritize patients not by the by who came in first through the door but by who had the most severity of illness to be able to be treated first to hopefully have the best survival rate. Um, so introducing AI or, as a, an abbreviation for artificial intelligence um, into healthcare systems um, to help with capacity, but also hopefully to help um, support the doctors and nurses in getting to the, the sickest patients the fastest. And so, so this was a huge breakthrough. A lot of resources were put to this. This is, you know, your smartest minds coming together. This was, you had Microsoft at the table. Um, you have the American Hospital Association. You know, you have, you have people from all across the world. You have your, um, you have your doctors. And, and what they found out was the data that they had been taking, while inclusive, Black people were less likely to come to urgent cares and to come to emergency centers and to seek treatment. And so their data wasn't in the system. And so because their data wasn't in the system and because their symptoms presented differently, then when they came into an urgent care that was using this artificial intelligence, their data wasn't represented and therefore their symptoms weren't being calculated correctly and their severity and needs weren't being met. And so the white patients were being favored. Was this intentional? No. Were they excluding the black data? No, they were including the black data that was there. What was being overlooked was that Black people were not accessing the urgent cares at the same rate and the symptoms were not the same. And so what was happening was that there wasn't an intentional consideration of racial equity in the conversation while building the artificial in intelligence. And so while we're having our conversations in our case conferencing or what's working or what's not working or or why is, why, is my, why is the person that I'm working with showing up late? Or why don't they make eye contact with me? Or, or, uh, or what can we do to, to make this space safer for someone? Are we bringing a racial equity lens? Are we bringing a more a, a lens that's looking through diversity or inclusivity lens to the conversation? And are we doing that as someone that is listening and having the opportunity to listen and make these relationships with the people that we're serving? And so just like these folks, uh, our doctors, Microsoft, are relying on the data of their evidence-based models. I mean, so do we but we have this extra tapped and we need to be intentionally considered. So I have a quote from Tim Brown, who is a uh, CEO of IDEO, which is another corporate company that I love. Um, People are so ingenious at adapting to inconvenient situations that they are often not even aware that they are doing so. They sit on their seatbelts, write their pins on their hand, hang their jackets and doorknobs, and chain their bicycle to park benches. I want you to think about how often do you think that potentially we have people accessing our systems that are so ingenious at adapting to inconvenient situations that we have set up for them that they're not even voicing that complaint because we have not asked. Because they're going to adapt. The situation is already inconvenient. Henry Ford um, is known to have asked customers. Henry Ford um, created 
the first cars. So Henry Ford is known to have asked customers what they wanted when working to in, invent uh, next. They responded a faster horse. So we are working with people who are consistently being asked to adapt to inconvenient situations. And our goal is to help them articulate their needs through insight, observation, and empathy. So I wanna take us back to our evidence-based models. What I saw was housing first, motivational interviewing, trauma-informed care. and quite a few others. Then I think about insight, observation, empathy. They go together. And we've got people that are adapting to inconvenient situations that when we might ask them at face value because they've adapted to situations, they might say, yeah, I'd, I'd like a faster horse. We might be able to use our evidence-based models to have intentional conversations with equity lenses to get them a step further. So trauma-informed care. We are already trained or in training to work with our guests, tenants, residents to ask ourselves, not, not what's wrong with them, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. How is your world perspective different than mine? How is it the same? How do we adapt? So a question. So does every True or false? Does every person give the same answer when we ask them why they are experiencing homelessness? You're such a bright crowd. I mean, we are at the homeless summit on the direct service provider track. No, I mean, of course they don't. Um, so they don't have the same story. So I don't have the exact same, I don't, we didn't come to this presentation with this answer for you of, let me give you from my perspective, the exact answer for every single one of your guest tenants and residents, how we'll solve this today. So I could start giving you answers uh, that um, I read somewhere, or we could start asking the people who don't have the same stories um, and try to like make that a uniform solution. Um, and there are, there are some things that we could definitely start with. So we could start with um, language access, right? We know, we know that's an issue. Um, somebody walks in, how much language access do we give people for assessments um, or diversion or our, our uh, quarterly assessments, or even you know, inputting um, things into our HMIS systems. Um, time flexibility. Uh, people come from different cultures. Uh, being on time means different things. Um, having the time to have a conversation. Uh, how are you in a culture in America is generally a, a two sentence MAC answer, and that means usually I'm pretty comfortable with you. In other cultures, uh, in India, it's usually like, you got 20 minutes because I'm about to tell you about like my last week. And that's how we have this conversation. And so like what, when I say I have an hour for my, for my, on my caseload for this person, did I, did I, did I manage this? Did we, did we create this budget appropriately for this caseload based on a racial equity conversation or based on a cultural sensitivity conversation? Did we look at who we're working with and did we ask them what they're going to need? 
um, based on that cultural? Did we look at cultural housing stability? Do we look at where this person would like to live or needs to live to be able to have the resources around them that would be culturally um, helpful for them? So of course, there are lists, there are resources that we could be examining in this, um, in this session. We could also start asking the people that we're working with who don't have the same stories, like we said. I mean, 100% y'all said, I don't say it. Um, to, and then be brave enough after these intentional conversations to have safe spaces to explore them with our supervisors and peers. So here's something that I know can be a little challenging is we have, I'm gonna back up a little bit. We have the training from our evidence-based models on insight, observation, empathy? Do we have the authority to be making the change? Do we have the safe space? Do we get the response in our face of the Pandora's box? Do we feel the burnout of, well, if I try to change this one thing, do I have to change them all? I don't think that burnout is very different than the burnout that we sometimes have to face when we come into work and we think, when I house this person, do I have to house them all? Or if I had one person return to homelessness, does this mean the system will never work? These are real things and that's why self-care is also a real thing. We need to have insight, observation and empathy to ourselves and take that very seriously. I mean, take it seriously that sometimes we are gonna be faced with authority that's going to make it difficult for us to have these conversations. But we should also try to find the bravery to be having these conversations with a feeling of that matters and with a feeling of an excitement of the dialogue that we can have in every conversation and with the hope that every conversation will not end the same way. And so if your first conversation ends with a no or we can't make this work, I'm very sorry about that, but maybe the second conversation won't. But we are having intentional considerations about equity and we are bringing that into these conversations that we are having and we are not letting it go. And that's how we show up to work every day is to keep knowing that we are going to be the bringer, the people that bring what we are listening to from our guests, from our residents, from our tenants, from the people that we are doing outreach with, from the the people that are experiencing homelessness on the streets that are unsheltered to the table. But we need to be able to do this Ooh, sorry, in a safe space. So I want to mention the description that was written for this session. Um, so I'm just gonna read it to you because I read it to myself a few nights ago. Let's challenge ourselves to face the reality that underrepresented populations in the United States make up a disproportionate share of the homeless population. With this knowledge, what can we as service providers do to intentionally move the needle in reducing inequities and bias in our daily practices with the people we serve? In this session, 
we will review systemic inequities of homelessness and housing, explore our biases, and consider the potential impacts of how we engage with people in our community. Sounds pretty cool. I then read that back to myself, like I said, a few days ago and thought, was I taking these people on a three-day retreat? Because that's why I've done this in the past. And today I have 60 minutes. So we got a mini review in the systemic inequities. And we touched lightly on what you can do. Be intentional about your listening and your conversations. Be brave. Remember that it matters and remember that it's hard. And let the fact that it's hard excite you because I believe the fact that it's hard and the fact that it's based in evidence is what already excites you about your job. Remember that self-care is also what keeps you going. And so please take care of yourself while we do this so that you can keep showing up to work. Bring racial equity to trauma-informed care. Bring racial equity to housing first. Bring racial equity to harm reduction, to filling out your acuity assessment, to filling out your intake assessment in another language. But to do all of this, you may have noticed I missed one of my learning outcomes, which was explore our own biases. So to do all of this, we've established we have to be brave and we know it's going to have to, to be hard, which means we have to have a community, which means we need to be in a safe space to do so. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to be okay with the little victories. Look out for burnout among ourselves and our peers, just like we already do as we try to end homelessness which means we have to be accepting, forgiving, and moving forward with each other. So remember that while just like the people we serve all have different stories, 100% in agreement, so do we. So I wanna take a second to watch this video. It's easy to put people in boxes. There's us, and there's them. The high earners, and those just getting by. Those we trust, and those we try to avoid. There's the new Danes, and those who've always been here. The people from the countryside, and those who've never seen a cow. The religious, and the self-confident. There are those we share something with, and those we don't share anything with. Velkommen. Det kommer til at stille jer nogle spørgsmål i dag. Nogle af dem kan godt være lidt personlige, men jeg håber, I vil svare ærligt på dem. Hvem herinde i rummet var klassens klog? And then suddenly, there's us. We who believe in life after death. We who've seen UFOs. And all of us who love to dance. We who've been bullied. we who've bullied others. And then there's us, the lucky ones who've had sex this past week. We who are broken-hearted. 
we who are madly in love. We who feel lonely. We who are bisexual. And we who acknowledge the courage of others. We who have found the meaning of life. And we who have saved lives. And then there's all of us who just love Denmark. So maybe there's more that brings us together than we think. TV2 Denmark. All that we share. So what I'm asking you here after this video is I see a lot of you every day. I didn't mention this earlier, but I've worked in homeless services not a long time, but for seven years. Be so accepting and give so much benefit of the doubt to all of the people you serve. To give that same benefit of the doubt acceptance to the people that you work with and the people that you serve with. And that if we're going to move forward into this brave space and to be able to have these intentional considerations and to be able to have these dialogues, these dialogues that are hard and are not gonna end and are gonna open up another conversation and another conversation and continue to push the needle, that we're gonna have to remember that we all have different stories. And we're going to have to be able to move forward together so that we can show up for another day. And so now I know we don't have a lot of time left. Ooh, that showed up big. Um, questions. Someone's already sending in questions. Look at that. Um, that's why it's showing up so large. As you send in questions, it should get smaller. Um, I might not have answers to all these questions. We'll start there. Um, but we can have a, um, these should show up. Um, if you'd like to do anonymous questions, they can show up here um, on the screen and we can take a look at them. Or I believe Russell, Leonard, Pamela can help me let people, I don't know if it's raise their hand or unmute. Um, or um, if they would like to do like an un anonymous question or if they'd like to be a person that answers a question, I'm all about it. And then my other thought is if just anyone has a comment, please feel free. I believe we have 10 minutes. Anyone there? Can I unmute people? Am I allowed to unmute people? You can unmute people. I can do it? Yes. I don't even know how to see people. Um, if you want to talk, uh, raise your hand on using that bar at the bottom of the screen, and I will give you permission to talk. Woohoo! Okay. So here we go. Here's one. How would you go about addressing your supervisor, program director, not using correct pronouns, and is what in what is supposed to be a safe environment for our trans clients? I'm sorry if I'm making you all um, dizzy. Ooh, that really gets, sorry. Okay. Well, I have a couple suggestions here. Like I mentioned, uh, what I would want you to feel safe as well. So is there someone else in your community that you might want to address this topic with if you are addressing someone of authority? So 
Is there um, a peer that you know that you might want to talk to your supervisor or director with you? Um, so you don't have to maybe address the, like, or have the conversation alone. That's something, um, that's a technique that I might wanna go about it with. Um, also, uh, having some uh, good background with it. So having something to, um, to give to someone is also helpful. So um, having, like we were saying here, like correct pronouns, right, for, um, for our trans individuals. Um, so potentially already having something written down that um, so that the person could be looking at it so that they could be referencing it as they're working to, um, to correct their language. And so even in that conversation, because it can be intimidating to have, to know to, that they would like to, to get better and, and, and using better pronouns, but it, and hearing it quickly and then trying to adapt and so if you can have something saying, hey, these are some of the pronouns, right, that, that are, um, that would be better to, that you know, are, are correct to use when working with trans individuals, um, could we be implementing this when speaking about trans, trans individuals? So we're not, we're not, again, uh, challenging the person, we're challenging the idea. And so um, the idea is how to correctly be, um, addressing the person. Um, and so the, I would say, do it, be trying to do it in a, an environment where it is with, with your supervisor or program director. If you don't feel comfortable doing it on your own, I would, my suggestion would be doing it potentially with another peer or staff member that feels the same way. Um, because sometimes it's helpful to do it with someone um, that you can then like debrief the conversation with as well. But I'm also open to other people's suggestions if they've been in a similar situation. But I don't see any hands raised, but I could be looking at this wrong. It's hard to see when you're in presenter mode. Um, there aren't any hands raised at the moment. Um, there are some? There are not. Okay. Okay. Cool. Don't be shy, guys. Or you can. Or if you have sent a response in and it's not showing up, tell me too, because then I need to see it. We are activated. Okay, I'll want to leave. That works too. How can I alter my speech to be more inclusive? That is a great question. So I'm actually going to offer a resource um, in this situation. So um, actually through the state. Um, so maybe we can, I don't know if we can send out a resource after Lynn, um, because I might not get the, um, the website address perfect off the top of my head, but, um, multicultural affairs through the Department of Heritage and Arts, sorry, I should have said that slower, um, if you go to their website page, um, through the state of Utah, if they have a tab that is training and resources, one of the tabs underneath that, I apologize, I have a photographic memory, so I'm trying to kind of walk you through it. One of the tabs underneath that is how to have more inclusive speech, and they actually have a dictionary, and it's not very long, so don't get too over intimidated, where it goes through exactly this, how to make your speech more inclusive. So it'll go through words and what words, um, can make your speech more inclusive and also what words are exclusive. And what I love is that they will have examples of if you're using this word, try replacing it with this word. So a really good place to start small is looking at the list of words you can replace and, and looking at that and saying, do I say any of these words? I do. And like, 
looking at the other list and being like, I'm going to switch those. And maybe that's your goal for like the next three weeks is replacing those. We have four minutes remaining. Thank you. So like MCA something, the multicultural bears. Um, no question, just want to say thank you, Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm not comfortable speaking freely to my supervisor because I'm not a person of color, I'm not LGBTQ, I'm not, oh, I am white, sorry. <laughs> okay, I, thank you, I appreciate this question. I have two responses in my four minutes uh, to this question. So at the Road Home, we are starting, um, well, we have an equity task force. Um, we have also dedicated um, part of my position to be specifically working um, towards making our system um, more equitable, um, anti-racist, um, and a more diverse space. Um, when a lot of the feedback that I received when I asked to spread from the equity task force to an agency-wide work group was that people didn't want to join because they were white, that they thought the work group needed to be diverse. Let me be clear, there did need to be diversity on the work group. Let me also be clear, we have a lot of white people in Utah. We have a, light, a, lot, of light, a lot of white people on our staff. If they are not there, then we cannot move the work forward. So you need to sometimes put your white guilt aside and show up to the table to move the work forward. But at the same time, you need to make sure to check your privilege and listen to the other people at the table and give them the weight to tell their story. Um, my second side of this is I'm a Latina. I have to check the white race box. Um, but at the same time, I also, my father is white and my mother is Latin. And so um, I got asked this question this week in a very nice way while I was nervous to give this presentation. Are you nervous to give this presentation? And this happens to me because you don't feel like you are brown enough. Um, this happens all the time. So yes, it does happen. Um, and that's even coming from someone that is, is, is split, but the, the, the point is we have to have intentional conversations, but if you are someone who is white, are you also making sure that you're listening to the other people at the table? So please speak to your, to your supervisor about it, but please make sure you're informed and please make sure that when there are other, that you're not, that you're looking at like making sure that you're not um, having any cultural appropriation and that you are moving the conversation forward when there are opportunities for people of color and our LGBTQ to, or are underrepresented to own their spot at the table as well. But if you don't show up, who's, there need to be people that show up. So keep it going. Good for you. With two minutes remaining, we have one question from Cedar. Cedar, hi. Hey, Elizabeth, uh, this was awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I don't necessarily have a question. I just kind of wanted to respond to um, the question about like making your language more inclusive. And I think that's something that is really important that we're starting to catch on to um, in social services is um, person-centered language. Mm -hmm. So acknowledging that, yeah, that person is um, Latinx or, you know, what, or black or, you know, whatever they want to identify as, but it doesn't make their entire person, right? So that person is a person of color, right? Rather than a colored person or that, per and it even applies to outside of race and stuff like that, right? I think that it's important to call people, you know, to say a person who has a sex offense, for example, rather than they are a sex offender. So I think that that's something that we, is really important um, and we're starting to do that. Um, but I think that, you know, it could also be spread over to the problem of race and being more inclusive is just using person-centered language so that you like they know that they see you as an individual and not just what you, um, a part of what you identify. Thank you so much, Cedar. 
Thank you. Is that time? It is. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. You've done an amazing job. And but we are going to need to uh, close this webinar and it will close in five seconds. Thank you okay. for all. Uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you.